Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast, where we bring you business-focused interviews with thought leaders and executive decision makers to deliver actionable information for founders, CEOs, and finance leaders to take your organization to the next level. I'm your host, Doug Atberg, and I'm looking forward to getting the conversation started. Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast. So today we are actually going to do part two of As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. So we're picking up basically right where we left off from yesterday. Okay, so this chapter, the effect of thoughts on health and body. The body is the servant of the mind. It obeys the operations of the mind, whether they be deliberately chosen or automatically expressed. At the bidding of unlawful thoughts, the body sinks rapidly into disease and decay. At the command of glad and beautiful thoughts, it becomes clothed with youthfulness and beauty. Disease and health, like circumstances, are rooted in thought. Sickly thoughts will express themselves through a sickly body. Thoughts of fear have been known to kill a man as speedily as a bullet when they are, con- and they are continually killing thousands of people just as surely, though less rapidly. The people who live in fear of disease are the people who get it. Let's coming out of a global pandemic. Let's uh, it, let, let's go up over that last part again. The people who live in fear of disease are the people who get it. Anxiety quickly demoralizes the whole body and lays it open to the entrance of disease, while impure thoughts, even if not physically indulged, will sooner or later shatter the nervous system. So what does this mean? This means that your mindset is is actually a key line of protection for your health. Uh, Continuing. Strong, pure, and happy thoughts build up the body in vigor and grace. The body is delicate and plastic instrument, which responds readily to the thoughts by which it is impressed, and the habits of thought will produce their own effects, good or bad, upon it. Men will continue to have impure and poisoned blood so long as they propagate unclean thoughts. Out of a clean heart comes a clean life and a clean body. Out of a defiled mind proceeds a defiled life and corrupt body. Thought is found uh, is fount of action, life and manifestation make the fountain pure and all will be pure. Change of diet will not help a man who will not change his thoughts. When a man makes his thoughts pure, he no longer desires impure food. So this is, this is a actually a pretty important part, which is that when you are, uh, you know, if you are trying to say lose weight, become healthy, what you sh- instead of trying to force yourself to follow a certain diet, you need to change your mindset. Continuing, clean thoughts make clean habits. The so-called saint who does not wash his body is not a saint. He who has strengthened and purified his thoughts does not need to consider the malevolent. If you would perfect your body, guard your mind. If you would renew your body, beautify your mind. Thoughts of malice, envy, and disappointment, despondency rob the body of its health and grace. A sour face does not come by chance. It is made by sour thoughts. Wrinkles that mar are drawn by folly, passion, and pride. It's a lot to process there. So, but what it's really saying is make sure to guard your mind. Continuing, I know a woman of 96 who has the bright, innocent face of a girl. I know a man well under middle age whose face is drawn into harmonious contours. I'm sorry, who is drawn into inharmonious contours. The one is the result of sweet and sunny disposition. The other is the outcome of passion and discontent. As you cannot have a sweet and wholesome abode unless you admit the air and sunshine freely into your room, so a strong body and a bright, happy, or serene countenance can only result from the free admittance to the mind of thoughts of joy and goodwill and serenity. On the faces of the age, there are wrinkles that are made by the sympathy of others, by strong and pure thought, and others that are carved by passion who cannot distinguish them. With those who have lived righteously, age is calm, peaceful, and softly mellowed like a setting sun. I have recently seen a philosopher on his deathbed, and he was not old except in years. He died as sweetly and peacefully as he had lived. There is no physician like cheerful thought for for dissipating the ills of the body. There is no comforter to compare with goodwill for dispersing shadows of, of grief and sorrow. To live continually in thoughts of ill will, cynicism, suspicion, and envy is to be confined in a self-made prison hole. But to think well of all, to be cheerful with all, to patiently learn to find the good in all, such unselfish thoughts are the very portals of heaven to dwell day in and day in thoughts. To do, sorry, to dwell day by day in thoughts of peace toward every creature will bring abounding peace to their possessor. 
Continuing, thought and purpose. Until thought is linked with purpose, there is no intelligent accomplishment. I'm going to read that again. Until thought is linked with purpose, there is no intelligent accomplishment. With the majority, the bark of thought is allowed to drift upon the ocean of lies. Aimless, aimlessness is a vice, and such drifting must not continue for him who would steer clear of catastrophe and destruction. They who have no central purpose in their life fall an easy prey to petty worries, fears, troubles, and self-pitying, all of which are indications of weakness, which lead just as surely as deliberately planned sins, though by a different route, to failure, unhappiness, and loss, for weakness cannot persist in a power-evolving universe. So what this is saying is that you don't need to have better circumstances. You need to have better purpose because if your life has better purpose, then your anxieties will naturally dissipate. Okay, continuing. A man should conceive of a legitimate purpose in his heart, set out to accomplish it. He should make the purpose the centralizing point of his thoughts. It may take the form of a spiritual ideal, or it may be a worldly object according to his nature at the time being. Whichever it is, he should steadily focus his thought forces upon the object he has set before him. He should make this purpose his supreme duty and should devote himself to its attainment, not allowing his thoughts to wander away into ephemeral fancies, longings, or imaginings. This is the royal road to self-control and true concentration of thought. Even if he fails again to accomplish his purpose, as he must until weakness is overcome, the strength of character gained will be the measure of his true success, and this will form a new starting point for future power and triumph. I'm going to back up and read that last sentence again. Even if he fails again and again to accomplish his purpose, as he must until weakness, weakness is overcome, the strength of character gained will be the measure of his true success, and this will form the new starting point for future power and triumph. So here's what this means. Even if it feels like you're failing, if you are moving toward a purpose, you are actually not failing. You are developing the strength of character and resolve that you need in order to be a success long term. Continuing, those who are not prepared for the, apprehens <clears throat> the apprehension of a great purpose should fix the thoughts upon the faultless performance of their duty, no matter how insignificant their task may appear. Only in this way can the thoughts be gathered in focus and resolution and energy be developed. Once this is done, there is nothing which may not be accomplished. The weakest soul, knowing its own weakness and believing this truth, that strength can only be developed by effort and practice, will thus believing at once begin to exert itself. And adding effort to effort, patience to patience, and strength to strength, will never cease to develop and will at last grow divinely strong. Internalize that for a moment. Just, just internalize that for a moment. Okay, continuing. As the physically weak, weak man can make himself strong by careful and patient training, so the man of weak thoughts can make them strong by exercising himself in right thinking. To put away aimlessness and weakness and to begin to think with purpose is to enter the ranks of those strong ones who only recognize failure as one of the pathways to attainment, who make all conditions serve them, and who think strongly, attempt fearlessly, and accomplish masterfully. Let's Review last sentence there. To put away aimlessness and weakness and to begin to think with purpose is to enter the ranks of those strong ones who only recognize failures as one of the pathways to attainment. So failure is not failure. It Failure is simply a one of the steps on the path to your ultimate success. Continuing, having conceived this purpose, a man should mentally mark out a straight pathway to its achievement, looking neither to the right nor left, doubts and fears should be rigorously excluded. They are disintegrating elements which break up the straight line of effort, rendering it crooked, ineffectual, and useless. Thoughts of doubt and fear can never accomplish anything. They always lead to failure. Purpose, energy, power to do, and all strong thoughts cease when doubt and fear creep in. The will to do springs from the knowledge that we can do. Doubt and fear are the great enemies of knowledge, and he who encourages them, he who does not slay him, them thwarts himself at every step. 
He who has conquered doubt and fear has conquered failure. His every thought is allied with power and all difficulties are bravely met and overcome. His purposes are seasonably planted and they bloom and will bring forth fruit and does not fall premature. That does not fall prematurely to the ground. Thought allied fearlessly to purpose becomes creative force. He who knows this is ready to become something higher and stronger than a bundle of wavering thoughts and fluctuating sensations. He who does this has become the conscious and intelligent wielder of his mental powers. Repeating, he who does this has become the conscious and intelligent wielder of his mental powers. Okay, last chapter. The thought factor in achievement. All that a man achieves and all that a man fails to achieve is the direct result of his own thoughts. In a justly ordered universe where loss of <clears throat> equipoise would mean total destruction, individual responsibility must be absolute. A man's weakness and strength, purity and impurity, are his own and not another man's. They are brought about by himself and not by another. And they can only be altered by himself and never by another. His condition is also his own and not another man's. His sufferings and his happiness are evolved from within. And he thinks as he thinks, so he is. As he continues to think, so he remains. A strong man cannot help a weaker unless that weaker is willing to be helped. And even then, the weak man must become strong himself. He must, by his own efforts, develop the strength which he admires in others. None but himself can alter his condition. This has been usual for men to think and say, many men are slaves because one is an oppressor, let us hate the oppressor. But there is amongst an increasing few a tendency to reverse this judgment and say, one man is an oppressor because many are slaves, let us despise the, the slaves. The truth is that the oppressor and slaves are cooperators in ignorance, while seeming to afflict each other are in reality afflicting themselves. A perfect knowledge perceives the action of law and the weakness of the oppressed and the misapplied power of the oppressor. A perfect love seeing the suffering which both states entail condemns neither. A perfect compassion embraces, ne embraces both oppressor and oppressed. He who has conquered weakness has pushed away all selfish thoughts and belongs neither to oppressor nor oppressed. He is free. So there, there is a lot packed into that, that paragraph. What this really means is political rank rankling over right you know who's the one percent you know who are the you know who are the disenfranchised who are the this or that um is frankly pointless uh because you know because the you know they're you know the victim mentality that keeps people impoverished and the desire to try to lord power over people that keeps you know that that keeps other people trying to maintain their position it's it's the same problem, just manifested differently. We should not be looking to uh, accentuate one side or the other. We should be looking to ascend above the, you know, above these base level desires and base level thoughts. That is really the only way that any person can get to a level of greater enlightenment. Continuing, a man may only rise, conquer, and achieve by lifting up his thoughts. He can only remain weak, abject, and miserable by refusing refusing to lift up his thoughts. Before a man can achieve anything, even in worldly things, he must lift his thoughts above slavish animal indulgence. He may not, in order to succeed, <clears throat> sorry, he may not, in order to succeed, give up all animality and selfishness necessarily, but a portion of it must at least be sacrificed. This means humans are still humans, but you must become less and less like the unthinking animals in order to ascend. Continuing, a man whose first thought is bestial indulgence could neither, could neither think clearly nor plan methodically. He could not find and develop his latent resources and would fail in any undertaking. Not having begun to manually control his thoughts, he is not in a position to control affairs and to adopt serious responsibilities. He is not fit to act independently and stand alone, but he is limited only by the thoughts that he chooses. There can be no progress nor achievement without sacrifice, and a man's worldly success will come by the measure that he sacrifices his confused animal thoughts and fixes his mind on the development of his plans and the strengthening of his resolution and self-reliance. The higher he lifts his thoughts, the greater will be his success, and the more blessed and enduring will be his achievements. 
The universe does not favor the greedy, the dishonest, the vicious, although on the mere surface, it sometimes may appear to do so. It helps the honest and magnanimous, the virtuous, all the great teachers of the ages have declared this in varying ways, but to prove it and to know, know it, a man has but to persist in making himself increasingly virtuous by lifting his thoughts. Intellectual achievements are the result of thought and consecrated to the search for knowledge by and for the beautiful and true in nature. Such achievements may sometimes be connected with vanity and ambition, but they are not the outcome of those characteristics. They are the natural outgrowth of a long and arduous effort of pure and unselfish thoughts. Spiritual achievements are the consumption of holy aspirations. He who lives constantly in the conception of noble and lofty thoughts who dwells upon all that is pure and selfless will, as surely as the sun reaches the zenith and the moon its full, will become wise and noble in character and rise into a position of influence and blessedness. Achievement of any kind is the crown of effort and the diadem of thought. By the aid of self-control, resolution, purity and righteousness, and well-directed thought, a man ascends. By the aid of animality, indolence, impurity, corruption, and confusion of thought, a man descends. A man may rise high to success in the world, even to lofty attitudes in the spiritual realm, and again descend into weakness and wretchedness by allowing arrogant, selfish, and corrupt thoughts to take possession of him. Victory is attained by right thought can be maintained only by watchfulness. Many give way when success is assured and rapidly fall back into failure. All achievements, whether in the business, intellectual, or spiritual world, are the result of definitely directed thought. They are governed by the same law and are the same method. The only difference lies in the object of attainment. He who would accomplish little needs sacrifice little. He who would achieve, achieve much must sacrifice much. He who would attain highly must sacrifice greatly. Actually, I was wrong. There is one more chapter. Okay, so last chapter, vision and ideals. The dreamers are the saviors of the world. As the visible world is sustained by the invisible, so men, through their trials and sins and sordid vocations, are nourished by the beautiful visions of their solitary dreamers. Humanity cannot forget its dreamers. It cannot let their ideals fade and die. <clears throat> it lives in them. It knows them as the realities which it shall one day see and know. Composer, sculptor, painter, poet, prophet, sage, these are all the makers of the afterworld, the architects of heaven. The world is beautiful because they have lived without laboring. Without them, laboring humanity would perish. He who cherishes a beautiful vision, a lofty ideal in his heart, will one day realize it. Columbus cherished a vision of another world and he discovered it. Copernicus fostered a vision of a multiplicity of worlds and a wider universe and he revealed it. Buddha beheld the vision of a spiritual world of stainless beauty and perfect peace and he entered into it. Cherish your visions, cherish your ideas, cherish the music that stirs in your heart, the beauty that forms in your mind, the loveliness that drapes your purest thoughts, for out of them will grow all delightful conditions, all heavenly environment. Of these, if you but remain true to them, your world will at last be built. To desire is to obtain, to aspire is to achieve. Shall man's beast, uh, <clears throat> basest desires receive the fullest measure of gratification and his purest aspirations starve for lack of sustenance? Such is not the law. Such a condition can never obtain. Ask and receive. Dream lost, lofty dreams, and as you dream, so shall you become. Your vision is the promise of what you shall one day be. Your ideal is the prophecy of what you shall at last unveil. The greatest achievement was at first and for a time a dream. The oaks, oak sleeps in the acorn, the bird waits in the egg, and in the highest vision of a soul, a waking angel stirs. Dreams are the seedlings of realities. Your circumstances may be uncongenial, but they shall not remain so if you only perceive an ideal and strive to reach it. You cannot travel within and stand still without. Here is a, <clears throat> here is a young, hard pressed by poverty, and uh, here's a youth, hard pressed by poverty and labor, confined long hours in an unhealthy workshop, unschooled and lacking in the arts and refinement. But he dreams of better things, he thinks of intelligence or refinement of grace and beauty, he conceives of, mentally builds up an ideal condition of life. The wider liberty and larger scope takes possession of him, unrest urges him to action, and he urges all his spare time and means to the development of latent powers and resources. Very soon, so altered, his mind, 
mind has become that the workshop can no longer hold him. It has become so out of harmony with his mindset that it falls out of his life as a garment is cast aside. And with growth of opportunity that fits the scope of his examined powers, he passes out of it altogether. Years later, we see this youth as a grown man. We find him master of certain forces of his mind that he wields with worldwide influence and almost unequal power. In his hands, he holds the cords of gigantic responsibilities. He speaks and lives are changed. Men and women hang upon his words and remold their character. Sun-like, he becomes the fixation and luminous center around which immeasurable destinies revolve. He has realized the vision of his youth. He's become one with his ideal. And two, you will realize your vision, not just the idle wish of your heart, be it base or beautiful or a mixture of both, for you will always gravitate towards that which you secretly love most. Into your hands will be placed the exact result of your own thoughts. You will receive that which you earn, no more, no less. Whatever your present environment may be, you will fall, remain, or rise with your thoughts, your vision, your ideal. You will become as small as your controlling that desire, as great as your dominant aspiration. Let me read that last sentence again. You will become as small as your controlling desire, as great as your dominant asposition. It is literally up to you. Continuing, the thoughtless, the ignorant, and the indolent, seeing only the apparent effects of things and not the things themselves, talk of luck, fortune, and chance. Seeing a man grow rich, they say, how lucky he is. Observing another become skilled in luxury, they exclaim, how highly favored he is. And noting the saintly character and wide influence of another, they remark, how chance helps him at every turn. They do not see the trials and failures and struggles that these men have encountered in order to gain their experience. They have no knowledge of the sacrifices they have made, of the undaunted efforts they have put forth, and the faith they have exercised so that they might overcome the apparently insurmountable and realize the vision of their heart. They do not know the darkness and the heartaches. They see only the light and joy and call it luck. Do not see the long, arduous journey, but only behold the pleasant goal and call it good fortune. Do not they understand the process, but only perceive the result and call it chance. In all human affairs, there are efforts and there are results. The strength of the effort is measure, measure of the result. Chance is not. Gifts, powers, material, intellectual, and spiritual possessions are the fruits of effort. Their thoughts completed, objectives accomplished, visions realized. The vision that you glorify in your mind, the ideals you enthrone in your heart, this you will build in your life, and this you will become. Okay, and <clears throat> turns out I was really wrong. There's, this is the last chapter, I solemnly promise. Serenity. Calmness of mind is one of the beautiful jewels of wisdom. It is the result of long and patient effort and self-control as presence is an indication of ripened existence, experience. And, <clears throat> and of a more than ordinary knowledge of the laws and operation of thought. A man becomes calm in the measure that he understands himself as a thought-evolved being. For such a knowledge necessitates the understanding of others as the result of thought. And, he, <clears throat> and as he develops a right understanding and sees more clearly the internal revelations of things by the action of thought of cause and effect, he ceases to fuss, fume, worry, and grief. He remains poised. The calm man, having learned how to govern himself, knows how to adapt himself to others, and they in turn reverence his spiritual strength. They feel that he can learn, that they can learn from him and rely upon him. He is more tranquil a man, becomes greater in his success, his influence is power for good. Even the ordinary trader will find his business prosperity increase as he develops greater self-control and equanimity. For people will always prefer to deal with a man whose demeanor is equitable. The strong, calm man is always loved and revered. He is like a shade-giving tree in a thirsty land or sheltering rock in a storm. Who does not love a tranquil heart, a sweet-tempered, balanced life? It does not matter whether it rains or shines or what changes come to those who possess these blessings. For they are always serene and calm. That exquisite poise of character that we call serenity is the last lesson of culture. It is the flowering of life, the fruitage of the soul. It is precious as wisdom, more desirable than fine gold. How insignificant mere money-seeking looks in comparison with a serene life, a life that dwells in the ocean of truth, beneath the waves, beyond the reach of tempest, in the eternal calm. How many people we know who sour their lives, who ruin what is sweet and beautiful by explosive tempers, who destroy their poise of character and make bad blood? It is a, 
<clears throat> it is a question whether the great majority of people do not ruin their lives and mar their happiness by lack of self-control. How few people we meet in life who are well-balanced, who have exquisite poise in that characteristic of the finished character. Yes, humanity surges with uncontrolled passion, is tumultuous with ungoverned grief, is blown about by anxiety and doubt. Only the wise man, only he whose thoughts are controlled and purified, makes the winds and the storms of the soul obey him. Tempest-tossed souls, whether, <clears throat> whether, you, whether you may be, under whatever condition you may live, know this. In the ocean of life, the isles of blessedness are smiling and the sunny shores of your ideal await your coming. Keep your hands firmly upon the helm of thought. In the core of your soul reclines the commanding master. He does not uh, sleep. Wake him. Self-control is strength. Right thought is mastery. Calmness of power. Say into your heart, peace be still. So uh, that was quite a bit to read through. But I think it, uh, or I would hope by this point, that the, the, the idea has firmly planted that your life is determined by your thoughts. And there is a tendency to blame circumstance one way or the other. And frankly, that's just not accurate. Uh, so start taking control of your thoughts today and that will manifest itself in action. And if you consistently can control your thoughts, discipline your mind and stay focused on the right course, the rest of your life is almost certain to follow suit. Uh, I really appreciate your time today and I'm looking forward to uh, talking again in the future. Thank you for listening to the Terminal Value Podcast. Share it with your friends by sending them to terminalvaluepodcast.com. For more information, please visit businessoflifellc.com for full access to Doug's products and services. All rights reserved. No part of this broadcast may be produced in any form by any means without written permission from Business of Life, LLC. All trademarks and brands referred to herein are the property of their respective owners.